Welcome to the next session. This is uh, the session on monetary and financial stability. And it's my big honor to welcome uh, two keynote speakers, Ed Sibley, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, responsible for uh, leading the supervision of financial firms and member of the SSM Supervisory Board. And he will uh, start with a keynote address, the banking union and financial stability uh, in the Eurozone. And Martin Wolf, uh, also known by, by all of you, chief econo economics commentator at the Financial Times. Everybody uh, waits uh, each week on his sharp comments uh, on different parts of the world. Uh, so he is probably the one most uh, suited for explaining how uh, to escape the trap, secular stagnation, monetary policy, and financial fragility. Uh, but before I uh, hand over to, to Ed, I would like to make a few comments on the, on the topic of this session. You, you know uh, that many players contribute to financial stability. If you take a broad view, financial stability uh, policy encompasses macro-potential policy as well as micro-potential supervision and regulation, recovery and resolution frameworks, and deposit guarantee schemes. All these areas provide important contributions to financial stability, but it is the broad consensus at least since the financial crisis, that macroprudential policy is the most important area in preventing or at least mitigating financial stability risks. Um, so uh, the relationship of monetary policy and macroprudential policy in order to complement its keynote on the banking union and financial stability. A lot, a lot has been said on the similarities, the differences, and the interplay of these two policy fields. And I would like to compare their relationship to a game of doubles in tennis. In order to be successful, both players need to adapt to the, others, uh, to the other player's game. If one player storms to the net, then the other, player has to f uh, the other player has to follow as soon as possible. Otherwise, the risk not being able to put the ball away or even getting passed. Both players share the same goal. In tennis, it is the win. In monetary and financial policy, it is ultimately a long-term and stable increase of people's prosperity and well-being. However, this ultimate goal is reached via different intermediate objectives. In, in my opinion, monetary and macro potential policy areas are complementary. Price stability, uh, price stability contributes to financial stability and vice versa. However, monetary policy has potential unintended consequences that can be tackled with adequate macro potential measures. Some examples, low or even negative interest rates squeeze interest rate margins of banks due to the so-called uh, zero low uh, bound uh, on deposits and thereby can negatively affect bank stability. In Austria, for example, the structurally low profitability of Austrian banks was one reason, among others, for implementing the systemic risk buffer. Low interest rates nece uh, necessary to achieve price stability can fuel various asset markets, equity markets, bond markets, and real estate. The Eurosystem macro potential policy allowed a number of European area countries to address these unintended consequences as borrower-based measures and higher risk rates for mortgage were introduced to deal with systemic risk stemming from real estate markets. By the way, the revised ESB regulation now explicitly stipulates that implication of monetary conditions for financial stability fall under the ESB's macroprudential oversight mandate to ensure that there are no taboo topics in the ESB in the future. I think this is an important precedent for macroprudential policy in general. 
Consistent uh, with their complementary function, monitor policy and macropotential policy have different objectives. The objective of monitor policy in the euro area is price stability. The objective of macropotential policy in the euro area is the reduction and mitigation of systemic risks. To be more specific, monetary policy impacts the funding rates of funds, banks, while macroprudential policy primarily impacts the spread between banks' funding costs and the loan rates. Some argue that there is a conflict between macroprudential measures, most importantly capital profits, and the transition, transmission mechanism of monetary policy. They suggest that higher capital requirements impede banking lending. Quite a few studies uh, show this is not the case. A BS study, an ECB study. Therefore, let's keep in mind that an allegedly apparent and often raised conflict does in fact not exist. To sum up, the complementary nature of both policy justifies separate objectives. This implies that I favor that both objectives are pursued by two separate sets of instruments. This is also known as the Timbergen rule. Alternatively, leaning against the wind would overburden monetary policy with a dual objective of maintaining consumer price stability and preventing asset price bubbles. The principle of separate sets of instruments is even more important in the monetary union where asymmetric financial cycles across member states exist. A notion that is supported by recent ECB study, therefore the national mandate of a macropotential policy is essential to allow national authorities to deal with country-specific consequences of a single monetary policy for the euro area. So monetary policy and macropotential supervision can be combined very effectively. However, as in a team of tennis doubles, to come back to my metaphor, excellent communication, the clear allocation of responsibilities, and team spirit are preconditions. So after these short remarks, Ed, I would ask you to propose uh, your uh, thoughts about uh, the connection between micropotential and, uh, and financial stability. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Andrea. So uh, just to follow on for that, uh, I'm uh, delighted to, to, to be here today. It's been a, a fascinating uh, morning already. I hope the afternoon is, is equally as interesting. Um, the theme of the conference, as uh, other uh, speakers have uh, touched on, really does encourage us to both look back, um, to have a kind of status check as to where we are today, and also to uh, look forward. Um, as has been graphically uh, illustrated already, uh, the last 20 years has seen uh, a, a fairly extraordinary period. Uh, we, we've seen um, the end of, uh, or a, a significant period of growth as we came towards the end of the, the Great Moderation. We've seen the, 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 the froth of it excess. Uh, we've seen an absolutely devastating financial crash. Um, and we're now seeing um, a, a somewhat patchy uh, but sustained uh, recovery. And as, as with any walks of, uh, of life, a failure to learn from one's experience uh, is, would be uh, uh, something of a, a tragedy and we would do so at our, at our, our own peril. So to, to fail to learn for the, from the overconfidence, um, the flawed assumptions, the groupthink uh, that was prevalent leading up to the crisis, the underestimation of risk, um, the excessive risk-taking um, and the misaligned incentives that were at play, funding imbalances, regulatory failures, uh, supervisory weaknesses, um, and much more uh, besides. I think it's also important that we don't let memories fade um, of the fundamental importance of financial stability to the functioning of the economy, to protecting consumers, to the general well-being of European citizens. And it's our collective responsibility to safeguard that uh, uh, stability. It's also clear from the, from the crisis and the immediate aftermath and subsequently how effective we can be, um, as Andreas talked about in terms of the tennis players, how, how effective we can be when we're working together with a common purpose uh, and a common aim.
Um, and that we can see through the work on monetary policy, on macroprudential policy, and microprudential uh, policy. So today I'm going to build from Andreas's comments some of the comments and discussion we've had uh, already this morning and really focus on how uh, the interplay between macroprudential policy and microprudential uh, supervision, how the new approaches to macroprudential policy that have emerged since the crisis have changed how we supervise at a microprudential level, including through the, through the SSM, um, and in turn how effective supervision is critical to uh, broader financial stability. Before I get in, into that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on the, on the Central Bank of Ireland. We have a very uh, diverse uh, and extensive mandate, much wider than most central banks. So we're there, we are obviously the national central bank uh, with a national competent authority from a prudential supervision perspective. So that would include supervising banks, insurers, uh, credit unions, asset managers, investment firms, payment institutions, so pretty much any financial firm that moves in Ireland. With a macro prudential authority, with a national resolution authority, uh, we have responsibility for financial conduct, including consumer protection, uh, market supervision, and anti-money laundering. And this broad range of responsibilities requires that we take a, a very holistic uh, view and approach to financial, st financial stability, particularly in the context of the Irish financial system, which is somewhat oversized relative to the Irish economy um, and is focused on, on both domestic and international uh, customers. So we, we work with a very explicit aim and ambition uh, that the financial system is sustainably serving the needs of the Irish and the European economy and its consumers and investors. And that helps formulate our views and drives the approach we take across the our full uh, uh, range of uh, responsibilities. We'd also recognize that in terms of discharging our responsibilities, there needs to be very strong co cooperation, strong cooperation at a local level within the central bank, but much more broadly at a, at a European level as well. And we're very committed to that, um, and in, in including uh, driving uh, and playing our part in greater convergence across the EU. A strong cooperation in terms of information sharing and embedding the work of macroprudential policy, macroprudential analysis into microprudential uh, supervision. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about, but we also see that there is more to be done in terms of the regulatory framework and tools, more to be done in terms of resolution, uh, banking union, capital markets union, which we have uh, touched on already. We're also acutely conscious in the central bank um, of, uh, uh, our previous speakers talked a little bit about political economy, the political economy of, of regulation and the tendency for the regulatory <coughs> pendulum to swing. Um, and we can see that, that, that being um, a risk today. One of the, one of the, one of the uh, defenses we have against that risk is, uh, is transparency, accountability, um, and making sure that those memories that I touched on uh, do not fade. Turning now then to macroprudential uh, policy and the interplay with supervision. Well, effective macroprudential policy implementation aims to strengthen the resilience of the financial system so that it can better withstand shocks. Um, it is necessarily forward-looking, and it should, among other things, prevent excessive credit growth and leverage, prevent excessive maturity mismatches, uh, limit direct and indirect exposure concentrations, and reduce and mitigate the potential for large systemic firms to pursue destabilizing strategies. Now, all these are, th are things that we should be focusing on from a microprudential perspective as well, uh, but on an individual firm basis. So therefore, it's entirely right that macroprudential uh, policy implementation affects microprudential supervision and vice versa. And just to take three examples of that, uh, macroeconomic assessments uh, are absolutely critical to the work of microprudential supervisors. To think about stress testing, the need to think about um, uh, growth, uh, unemployment, uh, real estate uh, prices, and so on. Uh, these are also factors we need to think about when we think about business model assessments at, a, at an individual firm uh, level, but we can't do that purely at an individual firm. We need to think about uh, the, the wider environment, and also as we think about forward-looking capital uh, and liquidity setting. Secondly, to, to, to expand a little bit on, on, on capital, um, pre-crisis, um, 
a much simpler regime uh, post-crisis now, actually there are a lot of different players involved in determining what's the appropriate level of capital for banks to hold. So we have the microprudential supervisors, we think about it from an individual firm perspective, pillar one, pillar two. We have a macroprudential um, looking at uh, additional buffers, systemic risk buffers, counter-cyclical buffers, uh, OC buffers and, 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 and the like. We also have resolution authorities um, that are thinking about total, total loss absorbency. Um, and so they, there is an, an absolute necessity for us to consider uh, in different perspectives, both at an individual level and at a, at a wider system level. And just as an aside, I think as long as we're going through that, uh, following a consistent framework and a, uh, and a similar approach to thinking about these things, it's entirely right that we might come up with different answers in terms of our capital levels for on an individual bank or an individual jurisdiction level uh, based on particular um, uh, idiosyncrasies in that jurisdiction or of, of, of that bank. And then thir a third example would be to look at borrower-based measures um, which are aimed to enhance both the resilience of the banking system but also um, uh, the borrowers themselves. They absolutely require microprudential expertise um, and involvement in design, calibration, and indeed the implementation. All this requires uh, a, a great deal of cooperation, engagement, both at a national and a, and a European level. It's easier when we have a kind of one-stop shop uh, as we do in the central bank. It's not, it's not easy, um, but it's easier. At a, at a European level, it becomes more complex. And clearly the infrastructure is there in terms of the likes of the ESAs, the European Systemic Risk Board, the Macro Prudential Forum, but it also requires us to, to have, a, have a collaborative and engaging mindset and, and to go beyond just the formal, the formal structures. Turning now to uh, resolution uh, and supervision and how they interplay from a, a financial stability perspective, but clearly a crucial part of the response to um, the financial crisis was to seek to address weaknesses in our ability to resolve failing firms and particularly around too big to fail. The, the, the response has resulted in the creation of uh, national resolution authorities, the single resolution uh, mechanism, and that's all uh, with the aim of implementing and uh, uh, enforcing uh, the BRRD. And resolution seeks to, or resolution planning seeks to enable uh, authorities to ensure that we can continue, um, uh, or ensure the continuity of critical economic functions when a firm fails, to minimize the economic impacts of firm failure, to avoid contagion across the financial system when a firm fails, and to limit costs to the taxpayer. In other words, resolution is very much focused on maintaining the functioning of the financial system. This clearly must be of interest to the microprudential supervisor. Um, where, where I see the kind of four key outcomes that a micro prudential supervisor should be focused on is firstly the financial resources of a firm, making sure that it has sufficient resources, um, uh, including through um, uh, a plausible stress. Secondly, there's a business model is likely to be sustainable through the economic uh, uh, cycle. Thirdly, that it's well run, well governed, has appropriate culture, people are uh, sensibly incentivized and so on. And then fourthly, that it can get out of difficulty, it can recover if it gets into difficulty, um, and if it can't, that it can be resolved um, uh, effectively. And so I would see resolution as being of primary importance to a, a, a micro prudential supervisor, albeit that the responsibility for resolution planning clearly sits uh, to one uh, separately, and I think that is, that, that is right. But the supervisor does have a role in understanding and addressing in impediments to resolution. They'll typically or often be very similar to those problems that we see coming through the recovery planning. Um, and where I do see that there is occasionally tension, which I, which I push back on, is if a firm, if a bank is only surviving because it's not resolvable, then it has fundamental viability problems and that requires supervisory intervention to address them. So I don't see that tension that some others see in terms of between supervision and, and resolution. The final topic I just wanted to touch on uh, was non-bank financial inter intermediation. So we can see that the financial system and financial stability risks extend uh, beyond uh, banks. And non-bank financing is, both by design and accident, uh, 
significantly increasing um, in terms of importance. There are plenty of positives uh, uh, around this uh, di dynamic, um, but there are also different risks. So just to take one example, the size, interconnectedness, and use of leverage make commercial real estate important from a financial stability perspective. Uh, coincidentally, the central bank is publishing research today which does show the positive aspects of increased non-bank financing into commercial real estate in terms of spreading of risk, uh, greater liquidity, bringing foreign investment in. But it also shows there's still a high degree of interconnectedness with the financial system and the, and the wider economy. It's still a highly cyclical sector um, and it remains a cause of financial stability risk. So just to, to lead on from that specific example, it's clear that microprudential micro supervisors must have a wider view of the financial system. They must take cognizance of the macroeconomic dynamics that are, that are taking place. They must embed the thinking and the work that's coming through the wider financial stability, uh, of, on, on wider financial stability issues in their thinking around supervisory strategies and the outcomes we're trying to achieve. And we must seek to cooperate across all sectors and not just look at it in a narrow, uh, in a narrow way. So I'll, con I'll conclude there. The post-crisis um, macro and micro prudential reforms have been very significant, have been extensive, and there's a lot of credit to be given to all those involved. They have created an entirely new European regulatory ecosystem. But the work isn't complete. There is more to be done. Um, we, need, we do continue to need to, to make progress on resolution, make banks more resolvable. Um, there's still some technical issues in there in terms of, in, including in terms of thinking about liquidity um, in resolution. And to my mind, there is still a problem around uh, too many banks uh, being international in life and a tendency for them to be national in, in death. And we do need to complete banking union, as has been touched on before. <coughs> Further work in terms of capital markets union to improve and increase risk sharing uh, and to build a, a kind of more resilient financial system to make it less uh, or more able to, to deal with economic shocks is also in, in important. And this work is all in the context of the longer term needs of the European economy and the well-being of its, uh, of its citizens. And this requires that we continue to build on that experience we've had over the last 20 years, not forget, not let memories fade too much. Uh, continue to engage uh, uh, effectively across all our responsibilities and make sure that we collectively continue to safeguard financial stability. So I'll finish there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Ed. This was a clear plea for cooperation and uh, which, uh, as you say, is easier if you have everything in, in one institution. This is not the way that uh, Europe has uh, put it and it's also not the way uh, Austria is going to put it. But uh, um, you also mentioned that resolution is uh, um, uh, has a big responsibility, a big role to play within uh, promoting financial stability. And I think that has something to do with what uh, Martin is going to say on debt and uh, financial stability. So uh, Martin, can I ask you to take the floor and come forward with your ideas? So, um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here and an honor. I, I think this is one of the few central banks, there are one or two others, that is prepared to invite me more than once to give my views. <laughs> I regard that as brave in every possible respect. And also, um, I'm greatly honored because as a journalist, I don't normally expect to be uh, on this side of the salt, as it were. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be, for me to be in Vienna. My father grew up here, um, and it made him, since he was, t to me, the wisest person I've ever known, shaped everything I think and believe that matters. And by the way, um, he was a friend of Stefan Zweig. We even have a letter from uh, Mr. Schweig written not much before his suicide. 
Um, the second thing I wanted to say, which makes it, I think, even more generous of you to have invited me, is um, I wish to apologize for my country. Um, it's a slightly strange experience, but I suspect my father would have recognized a little of it, to be inside a country committing suicide. Um, I will say no more on that. The third thing, which I think is perhaps the most important way of explaining what I'm trying to do, um, which, as I said already, fits very well with one of the presentations before this, on the session before this, is think of it as what Larry Summers might be telling you if he were here instead of me. Um, our views evolved largely in parallel over about 15, 20 years. I would argue I got there before him. And of course, I think I can substantiate that, but I won't go into that. But of course, Larry, in his typical way, discovered the perfect way of selling that idea by reinventing Alvin Han or rediscovering um, Alvin Hansen's notion of secular stagnation. And that is part of my own intellectual journey back in the 90s. I was a pretty conventional uh, orthodox thinker on economics, um, monetary and fiscal policy. But over the last 20 years, I've been increasingly influenced by the views of Hyman Minsky, Wynne Godley, and Richard Kuh. And I strongly suggest that even if you think they're all wrong, you study them carefully. They're not stupid. Now, with that said, let me just tell you what I'm going to try and cover. And first, let me just make a simple statement which will explain what I'm trying to do in these remarks. It's pretty obvious, but it's something I think far too many economists fail to do. We have to remember that everything depends on everything else. Monetary and fiscal policy is not carried out in isolation. And the policy of one country is not carried out in isolation of the policies of all other countries, and particularly of the, not only of the policies, but of economic developments in all other countries. And this is, the, to me, the single most important clue to trying to understand why we've got into this extraordinary monetary policy environment, which was described so well in the previous section, and also how we might escape from it. So what I want to cover, it, first of all, is some aspects of this quite extraordinary economic world we're living in. And secondly, I will dare to explain very briefly very briefly and very boldly why we're in, in my view, why we're in this strange world. You don't have to agree with my view, but I think everybody has to work out why we're here. Then I'll talk briefly about policy options, how we've dealt with and how we might deal with this, and finally, what the end game might be. Because it seems to me as clear as daylight, and at least on this I think we should agree that we're not through this. We don't even begin to be through this. And if we don't think very hard about the fact that what we're in is not normal, not merely not normal, it doesn't look stable, I don't think we're going to get very far in thinking about fiscal monetary and financial stability. So with that, let me start off with my single most favorite uh, chart. But before that, let me just go briefly through what I think needs to be explained ultra-low nominal interest rates, ultra-low real interest rates, persistently sub-target inflation, the huge rise and subsequent stabilization of debt. We haven't begun to grow out of debt. In fact, we haven't grown out of debt in the developed world at all. And of course, crucially, since we're talking about fiscal policy, the shift of debt from the private to the public sectors. And I think all this is explicable, provided we focus on what's been going on, not in government policy, but in the private sector. Everything done in government policy, including the central bank and fiscal policy in different countries, is a consequence of behavior in the private sector. So that explains this first chart. So this is my favorite chart. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's been Germanicized a bit. Um, it goes back to 1694. 
There are probably not many charts that go back to 1694. Um, it's the charts of the, of the base rate or bank rate of the Bank of England, which once upon a time was a respectable and important central bank, um, since that date. And it really has only one important point to make, if you look along this line, that in all previous history of Britain, over those centuries, which included two world wars, the Great Depression, the Napoleonic War, in fact, what I refer to as the 120 years war with France, which Jean-Claude will understand, starting under Louis XIV and ending in 1815, um, interest rates for the central bank were never below 2%. They have been way below 2% ever since the crisis, and we don't see the slightest reason at present to expect them to get back to 2% in the time horizon we can imagine. So this is really quite extraordinary. The second chart, again taken from the UK because we've had index link gilts for so long, and it's a very simple chart, is the yield on 10-year index link gilts, which have been around actually since the 80s, but this goes back to 92. And you will see that it has been steadily in decline with two big downward leaps. The first downward leap was in 97, 98, when it basically halved from about 4% to 2%. I assume everybody here knows what happened between 97 and 98. And the second is the next great financial crisis, the global financial crisis, which saw real rates falling from about 2% to actually negative levels. That seems a bit below, that's low, lower than in the US where tips are around zero. But essentially, since the financial crisis, we've been at real interest rates for everybody in the neighborhood of zero. This is not normal for so long. So that's the second uh, thing. At the moment, by the way, in the UK, they're minus two. Um, German real rates are, of course, essentially the same. Not very different. The third chart you've already been given, so I don't really need to repeat this, is what this looks like for the major central banks of the world. And here I've just focus on the Fed, the ECB, and before it, the Bundesbank, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan. And you know we've been basically at zero, at some rates negative, since the crisis. But I like to remind people of Japan. Japan has had essentially near zero central bank rates since the mid-1990s, which is now getting on for a quarter of a century. And Japan's principal problem is it cannot get inflation above zero. Think about it. That's a very peculiar world. None of us in the 80s thought that this was conceivable. And I am not even going into, because I don't have the space and time, I'm not even going into what's happened to the, the balance sheets, except to note that in the case of the Bank of Japan, they're basically buying all the government debt. They're well on the course to owe most of the net government debt in the next two or three, four years. Depends a bit on the details. So this is an absolutely astonishing monetary policy environment by historical standards. And this is, again, is just to remind you of consumer price inflation. I've used core consumer price inflation because I've got lack of time. And the figures are slightly messed about by the fact that taxes, consumer taxes are included in Japanese data and they've done some strange things with it. But essentially what you can see is very clearly core consumer price inflation in Japan is close to zero. In the Eurozone, it's been close to one now, really more or less since shortly after the crisis. And the US and UK, are close to two despite really spectacularly strong monetary policy and in both cases very, very, very low unemployment by recent historical experience. And finally, we experience, and this is debt of over GDP of mature economies, an enormous rise in debt ratios relative to GDP before the crisis, an immense credit expansion. I could go further back in history, and it just takes you back further, but that was the big boom. And since then, it has remained roughly stable in relative to GDP. Um, and the components of that stability are very, very significant. 
So there was, as the green line shows, a massive rise after the crisis in government debt as it substituted for private debt. The financial sector has deleveraged a little, but the scale of the balance sheets of the financial sector are still roughly where they were in 2006 relative to mature countries' GDP. There's been a modest reduction in, GD in the um, household debt relative to GDP, and there's been a really quite significant rise in non-financial corporates, um, which has remained a worry. So we uh, got into the crisis with massive debt, it blew up in the financial crisis, and we haven't really got out of it. So how do we explain what we are seeing? Well, I argue that global demand has been structurally weak since the early 2000s. This was masked by a set of unsustainable, credit-driven property bubbles in major developed countries, particularly the US, but also the European periphery, periphery until the global financial crisis. These bubbles all collapsed in 2007-9, bringing the rapid growth of credit to the private sector in the high-income countries and the rapid expansion of the financial sector to an end. And the link booms in property construction and household consumption, of course, weakened dramatically. Subsequently, a combination of extraordinarily loose monetary policy on any definition and substantial fiscal deficits in a number of high-income economies particularly the US, with cre combined with credit-fueled investment demand in, Japan, in China, sustained demand. At the global level, the overall exceptional and fragile environment of the last 20 years has not ended. And I put this chart in because I think it's such a miraculously wonderful example of that everything depends on everything else. Our credit bubble ended or oh, perhaps I put it around the other way, the Chinese credit bubble began exactly to the year when our credit bubble ended. Why? Because demand for Chinese exports collapsed with the depressions and recessions in our economies. The Chinese had to offset this collapse in demand. They offset it very precisely, it's very clear in the figures, by the biggest investment boom in the history of the world, which occurred at exactly the time that trend growth in China was slowing. It's quite remarkable. And this what required an immense credit-fueled property and construction boom, which has generated a lot of bad debt. So to put it very briefly, China started doing what we had done when we stopped. So why has global demand been structurally so weak over this 20 years? I will argue there are eight factors. I don't have time to go through them all. First, crucially, fear of current account deficits in leading emerging economies after the Asian financial crisis. As I like to point out, the single most extraordinary fact about the global economy, again, not paid, people don't pay enough attention to it, compared to where we were in the first globalization of the late 19th century, is that the emerging world as a whole, and above all the fastest growing countries in the emerging world, have been capital exporters, not capital importers. And crucially, they were huge capital exporters before the financial crisis. This is linked, of course, to ultra-high private savings rates in emerging Asia, especially China, far and away the highest savings rates of any major economy in the history of the world. By the way, they've declined a little, but they're still incredibly high. Third factor, aging in high-income income economies. Do not underestimate the significance of that. Slowing productivity growth in high-income economies, again, beautifully laid out in the presentations before, in the session before. Declining need for physical investment by governments and corporations in high-income countries, partly because of aging and partly because we are moving into a deindustrialization phase. Rapid declines in the relative prices of capital goods, especially IT-related capital goods, a point that Larry Summers has made particularly powerfully. Shifts in the functional distribution of income towards profits and away from wages. Shifts in household distribution of income towards the better off. 
The net effect of all this has been a massive, in my view, global shift towards ex-ante savings and away from ex-ante investment, generating the collapse in real interest rates we have been seeing. Policy in this world. What can we say about policy in this world? The pre-crisis world of credit fuel growth as a way of dealing with the underlying excess saving relative to investment condition, I would describe for this purpose a secular stagnation stage one or SSS one. The post-crisis world of fiscal deficits and ultra-loose monetary policy can be defined as secular stagnation stage two or SSS two. During SSS one, the West as a whole behaved like Japan in the 1980s. During SSS two, the West behaved like Japan in the 1990s and 2000s and continues in significant ways to do so, though not to such an extreme case, extreme need, degree. In SSS 1, that's pre-crisis, property bubbles supported demand and private sector debt and the financial sector exploded in size, just as happened in Japan in the 80s. In SSS 2, balance sheet, sheet deflations stifled or weakened private demand over and above the longer term structural weaknesses of SSS 1. So governments of crisis hit economies, ran fiscal deficits just like Japan, thus the doubling of fiscal de debt relative to GDP roughly that you've seen, and central banks moved to ultra low rates and big expansions of their balance sheets again just like Japan. And it wasn't because they wanted to. Nobody wanted to do this. They had no acceptable alternative. The only policy alternative to this would have been mass debt destruction, which is, of course, what happened in the 30s and led to Irving Fisher's famous discovery of debt deflation. This is not a tolerable alternative. No government or central bank that tries it will last more than a few months. It's not on. So, so what can we say then about what we can do in this world and how to see this world. Fiscal and monetary policies are endogenous, of course, not exogenous. They are driven by the behavior of the global private sector, which is frequently out of long-term equilibrium, as in my view it is today. These disequilibria drive policy makers towards choices that risk increasing instability in the long term, especially in finance. By the way, this will not be true for all countries, provided they can run large enough current account surpluses, they can balance their own economy, but that will be the expense of debt fuel growth somewhere else. The standard macroeconomic policy choice is in sum between public borrowing and private borrowing as engines of demand. The alternative to these involve doing something really seriously different and they're very, very radical, so I'm going to ignore them altogether. So finally, how might all this end? Let me just, here. So here I'll just, sorry, I apologize. So this is the very last two charts. I think there are five broad possibilities. Interest rates remain consistently below long-term nominal growth. I mean longer-term nominal interest rates remain below long-term nominal growth. Demand becomes structurally stronger. The various factors I've, I've talked about diminish. Exceptional monetary and fiscal policies can be slowly withdrawn. Economies grew, grow smoothly out of indebtedness. That is, as it were, the nirvana solution to where we are now. The second possibility is the status quo continues, ultra low interest rates forever, but tolerable growth of nominal and real GDP and no massive instability. It's today forever. It's Japan. Third, there is an inflationary surprise. Central banks have pushed the Phillips curve to the limit, and at some point it bites back. Central banks fail to respond quickly, so the real burden of debt is then substantially reduced as we have a rerun of the 1970s. And if anybody of my age, there are one or two here, I think, thinks back to the early 70s, the similarity between, of the connection between Trump and Powell 
and Nixon and Burns is staggering. Um, the fourth policy po option is policy generates an inflationary surprise. Central banks raise rates sharply. They don't accommodate this. They react dramatically to emerging inflation, and that leads to debt li liquidation, that is mass bankruptcy and a quite a deep recession, along quite possibly with another financial crisis. Fourth, there is an unexpected, fifth, sorry, and finally, there is an unexpectedly deep downturn for whatever reason, perhaps because of a policy shock or perhaps for some other reason, Central banks are unable to respond. We have a deep recession and debt liquidation starts. The key point I would like to leave you with is that we are clearly in a global policy trap. It's one in which the Eurozone and all of us are part of a whole world system. We need to find a way out of it. The requirement for this are cr is crucially sources of demand that do not ex depend on explosive expansions in arguably unsustainable debt. At present, we do not know how to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, unsurprisingly, I'm convinced again that it was a good idea to invite you again. Uh, and uh, I think you, you brought forward uh, lots of ideas on what kind of uh, future developments we, we need to look at. Maybe we need to discuss a bit more on the possible uh, solutions, possible ways out. And uh, I, I would like to take, uh, to, to offer you, uh, people from the, from the audience, to ask questions. Uh, I think both of the, uh, the discussions uh, or contributions uh, have been uh, thought provoking, so maybe you, you want to, to ask uh, questions. There is one in the Rose shirt and two uh, in the back. Yes, uh, Graham Bishop. Um, I have a question for both uh, speakers. But first of all, just to go back to Peter Muslecker's uh, comments in the previous session about the growth of the complexity of the financial markets as being a key problem. And if we're looking back by the decades, and Martin obviously encouraged us to look back more than decades. So um, the question then for, for Ed Sibley is the growth in derivatives over the past few decades has been dramatic. Can he now really assure us, heart on, hand on heart, that he knows how to resolve uh, non-bank financial institutions like CCPs, which have now concentrated, as a matter of policy, the derivative risk into a limited number of small private sector companies? Derivatives in Europe, uh, Euro-denominated, are, what, 10 times EU GDP? For the UK, it's 50 times UK GDP. These are colossal numbers. Now, if Ed cannot guarantee that he can resolve CCPs, etc., and there is a, an explosive problem in the derivatives market, perhaps Martin could reflect on how that might flow back into this mountain of debt, which everybody thinks has been the risk has been shifted off to somebody else via the derivatives markets. Thank you. And there are two in the back, yes? I don't know who was the first one. <coughs> Hi, I'm Jussi Lindgrenad from the Prime Minister's Office of Finland. Uh, thank you for the very um, interesting uh, presentation. I actually have a question which relates also to the previous discussion a bit. So, <coughs> uh, given that I assume that that what Mr. Wolf said is, is quite quite true, that we're in a so permanent in could be in a permanent liquidity trap, so to say, and if we indeed cannot push with a string and, and uh, we cannot generate uh, sufficient demand to, to, to suppress the debt levels, which is, I guess, the, the, the key here that we, we have too much debt globally. Uh, so what's your take, and, and this is, I, I guess, especially for Mr. Wolf, since you're an independent thinker, that uh, so, sort of, that uh, do we actually need to go further? Do we need to, let's say, start opening up uh, deposit accounts at the central bank for the public households, corporates, just crediting them in a, enough 
so to uh, create nominal demand, and which <coughs> which leads um, also to my second short question is more generally, what's your take on on this so-called uh, modern monetary theory? Thanks. Thank you. And the third question also there, and I would ask the other two gentlemen to to wait for the next one. Yeah, uh, Christoph Hedrich from Commerzbank in Frankfurt, and uh, I'm very. Uh, appreciated the notion that everything depends upon uh, everything else. And so, so my question is about the interdependencies between monetary policy and the role of banks. And uh, we have heard here that uh, money markets, uh, interbank markets have, um, uh, money markets have broken down. We have heard that uh, banks are no more liquidity providers, uh, not even uh, market makers. Non-banks, have a positive impact indeed. They can, but they don't take default risks, to my knowledge. And that's my question. What is the role of banks in the economy because of the margin squeeze? Yeah? Deposit rates cannot go below zero. Banks do not earn enough money with their core business. Platforms are sh only shifting default risks to private customers, direct, indirectly. So my question one is, are private customers prepared to this? And the second, and even for me personally, more important question is, uh, yeah, are supervisors a bit nervous now about uh, the function of banks in taking risk and their ability to do so? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I would like uh, maybe add to, to, to start on the, on the last one. Um, with, the, with the role of banks and, and also with the role of supervisors, which will be also a question to you afterwards. Uh, <coughs> there are um, two really easy questions to, to answer that on the CCP one. Uh, um, <laughs> so, I mean, I would see that the, uh, that the role of banks is uh, continuing to change and being under uh, business models being under very significant uh, pressure, both in terms of what's happening from a monetary policy perspective and the nature that the likelihood that that will, uh, those challenges will continue um, in the medium to, to long term, uh, plus then other factors uh, that, that are, that are, that are uh, at play, which you, some of which you touch on uh, in terms of non-bank competition. Um, uh, we can we could talk about disruptive technology as 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 well, um, and I think that there is uh, there are some real risks there uh, in terms of kind of the, the the long term sustainability of of many banks. Um, we have a um, credit union sector in Ireland which is uh, going through a period of sustained uh, slow and painful decline, um, and is really struggling to find its. Um, niche to, conti to continue, um, and I would see that there is some risk there for, for, for the banking sector. Um, from a, a supervisory perspective, it kind of comes back to those, those four things I talked about. Um, I, I'm, I am focused um, on, on ensuring that the financial system is serving the needs of the economy and the end consumer. Um, I am somewhat agnostic as to how that's done. Um, uh, if there are other um, entities, other ways of doing things beyond the banking system, uh, then so long as the risks are understood and being uh, managed effectively, and there are challenges there from a regulatory and supervisory perspective, then that's okay. Um, and I think what we might see is more kind of, uh, I, I think, sorry to, to, to cut to the chase, I think that the, uh, levels of return on equity across the banking system is, are unlikely to return to where they were pre-crisis. Um, elements that there, there will be banks that turn into utilities, perhaps, um, and significant challenges in terms of um, uh, technology and, and wider uh, environmental factors that we need to be very conscious of um, as supervisors, but that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that we have to step in and prevent. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the, the, the main question on this issue, whether uh, these other sectors or other uh, participants are understanding the risks and uh, are we understanding what they understand. 
Uh, Martin, there were these questions on um, resolutions and, uh, and the mountain of debt, as you were referring to, and uh, the other question on the central bank accounts uh, hold by private uh, participants. So these are wonderful questions, and I have the following general points, which I think come out of what we have experienced. Um, so if there were very large failures of systemically significant entities, and I think central catering houses are clearly fall into that category, we know that um, the sovereign balance sheets will be used. I think we just know it. Um, the only question, of course, is whether the sovereign balance sheets can still be used um, because, of course, they're much more ex expanded than before. But my view is that for the major countries of the world, above all the US, they can still be used. Um, of course, the implication of this is that when risks become systemic, uh, you're talking about a major financial crisis. This is always a sovereign issue. It's not private. And that leads to me my second point, which is that the last 15 years have reminded us if we ever had the slightest doubt, and it would be very foolish to have doubt on this, that the banking system is not private. May I repeat, the banking system is not private. Now, could we have a banking system that is private? Probably, but it wouldn't like, look like this one in any possible respect. Now, I, I don't have time to go into that, but I'm happy to do so in privately if somebody wants. The question, of course, is when the monetary environment is as peculiar as it is now, what do these semi-private institutions, which are squeezed but also supported by sovereigns, supposed to do? And the answer to that for me is, it's not clear. Um, there are things central banks could do to help them. They could, for instance, decide to lend to them at significantly negative rates while um, making their deposits um, have significantly positive rates. It will be very profitable for banks, and making banks profitable is probably the, one of the single most important purposes of central banks. We don't say that very often, but it happens to be true. However, if they did that, they would be running at a loss, and it might become a political issue pretty damn quickly. So the answer is, in this monetary policy environment, the role of banks is really not very clear, and it's very problematic, and nobody wants to think about it. Um, and then that links to the final question, which was actually the second, which is the permanent liquidity trap, which is, of course, another way of expressing the same set of points. Um, I don't know what will ha happen because it depends really on future developments, but I'm prepared to make a very, very confident prediction, which is if we have another really big global recession, which has significant financial sector consequences, we will end with something that looks like MMT. You may not like it, in fact, I hate it, because I think giving that much power to the monetary system starts looking quite dangerous. But I think it's where we'll end. And if you want to just look at a book which is by a perfectly sane individual on why we might end there, what it might look like, I suggest you read Adair Turner's Between Death and the Devil. So you better pray there's not another significant recession in this environment because it will end up in a place you really don't want to be. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think Ed will, will have a comment uh, on, uh, on the last two issues. Well, I just, uh, I just thought I'd just start from a very final point. I shared a recommendation on uh, Adair Turner's book. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good book, very, very uh, in interesting. Um, uh, in, in turn, there are no guarantees. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to be in a position to, 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 to guarantee anything about CCBs. I, I think we have, um, Martin touched on this very briefly earlier, um, because of Brexit, which I've, I was keen not to talk about at all. <laughs> um, so am I. We have spent more, a, a lot of time over the course of the last six to 12 months 
uh, thinking about this type of issue, um, perhaps a little bit more than had been done before. Um, that hasn't necessarily given us the assurance that you've sought through the questions, um, but I, I think it is certainly something that is being uh, actively considered. And then uh, just a final comment I'll just, just make in response to the, the, the question on the banks themselves. I mean, there is, an a, there is the other side of monetary policy, and the reason that monetary policy has been so active in terms of supporting uh, economic growth within the, um, uh, globally and within the Eurozone. Um, and one thinks about the counterfactual to that um, and the, the alternative where that hadn't taken place and the depth of the recession that would have ha happened uh, in that scenario and the difficulties the banks would have been in that circumstance uh, in terms of default risk and so on. So I think that one has to look at it with, um, uh, with a couple of different lenses. I mean, there's no doubt the authorities saved the banking sector to save the economy. Unfortunately, it has been perhaps worth adding, it has had a hell of a political backlash. So, so we have to discuss the supervisory function, but maybe before that, uh, uh, we will have additional questions from the floor. Bastian, uh, we will not be able to serve everybody. Here in the front, where's the microphone? Bastian and uh, Ulrich. Bastian Yaz with Singular Resolution Board. I really liked your uh, point on uh, no sovereign balance sheets will be used uh, in terms of a crisis to, to resolve the banks, but then somebody would need to change the framework, uh, which now clearly prescribes that no uh, bailout should take place uh, in this respect. So uh, I'm, uh, as much as I, 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 uh, I would, uh, or I tend to agree with, uh, with, with your conclusion, there is a, then a obvious uh, political problem in, in this respect. And then on, uh, on, uh, on the, other, uh, the other remark is, uh, how, how do you comment the, 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 the fact that uh, 20 years since inception of Euro, uh, five years since inception of uh, SSM, a couple of years since the inception of uh, single resolution uh, uh, policy, we still uh, uh, deal with uh, more than 3,000 banks uh, in uh, banking union, more than 5,000 banks in the wider European Union, there was no uh, single uh, consolidation or any other uh, attempts on, uh, on making the, the, the banking system a bit uh, more uh, competitive. Uh, and if nothing else, I mean, uh, you all uh, 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 somehow uh, uh, tried to draw the anal uh, analogies with, uh, with uh, and then uh, the conclusions from, from uh, uh, um, economic textbooks that I think we all uh, studied, but there is no economies of scale in, uh, in uh, European banking industry. So how come uh, this, uh, despite all the efforts to, to put the banking union in place, we are still dealing with, uh, with the reality that is uh, far from uh, something that we try to put so nicely on the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Next question over there. Yeah. John Cole. Hmm? Lutka Schupnik from the OECD. Um, I mean, the sa globally savings and investment should be some kind of identity unless, uh, of course, it's not investment but consumption or uh, malinvestment. Uh, what role does that play in your story, if any? And the second question, um, will the demographic change and the development of uh, emerging economies uh, not reverse uh, the picture that, that you portray? And then you end up Japan not being forever. And John Glow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would echo the question on the structure of the banking sector in Europe compared with the other big economies, including the United States, which is really uh, seen from uh, a distance. Uh, absolutely striking and humiliating, if I may, for the European. Now, uh, to Martin. Thought experiment. Uh, first of all, I go very much along your uh, remarks, which are absolutely wonderful. Uh, but thought experiment. We, we are living in a global economy where growth is reasonable, growth per capita is reasonable. Uh, we do not have ex ante big gaps between uh, uh, savings and investment. Uh, still, we see that the percentage of global outstanding public and private, both global debt outstanding public and private, as a proportion of GDP continues to augment regularly. 
it doesn't seem to me impossible. You could imagine a model where it would function like that. Of course, that indicator, global debt outstanding public and private on the GDP, upon the GDP, would signal that financially that global economy is more and more vulnerable. Do you think or not that there is also an element to introduce in your uh, sketch where we have a problem of the political economy of all our countries as regards the arbitrage between equity and debt? And I can signal, of course, a number of fiscal environments that are very stupid from that standpoint because they obviously are privileging debt uh, upon equity which is, again, augmenting vulnerability over time. Thank you. So I have to apologize by all the others who have, uh, of course, uh, very important questions. We have to uh, stop for lunch after this round, and uh, maybe this time, uh, Martin, you could, you could start uh, um, um, these uh, um, the questions on the emerging market and especially also on the last one, um, debt versus equity in, in this highly indebted uh, situation. Yeah, if I may, I know we've got, I just want to refer before I do so to the opening question because as you rightly say, um, what I said would happen is supposed not to happen. Um, well, I can assure you that in the time of the crisis, um, in the US in early 2008, the idea that there would be something like the TARP was not thinkable. And why was the TARP passed? Well, I'll give you one very simple story. It's a very famous story, which is the Sunday afternoon. I think it was the second time it would have been rejected the previous week by Congress. Um, I think it was the second time, it was a Sunday. Uh, ben Medanke was in the room, I think, with Nancy Pelosi. I'm, these details, are, they're, in, they're in my book. Um, and he was asked, well, what will happen to the US economy if we don't agree to this tomorrow? Um, and Ben answered, there won't be a US economy if we don't agree to this tomorrow. <laughs> I promise you that if the president of the ECB made a remark like that, there will be sovereign bailouts. Um, I'm not saying that the president of the ECB would have reason to do so or would do it, but if it would, he would do it. Uh, the safety of the republic is the supreme law. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by the question of why there hasn't been more consolidation in the e e e Eurozone. Um, and I think uh, the answer is ultimately, ultimately, to my view, the sovereign backstop remains national backstops. That's my view. Uh, and uh, I'd be very interested in Ed's view on why that hasn't happened. But it is striking that it hasn't happened. Um, Ludger Schuchner gave me uh, what, exactly what I'd expect, the Austrian perspective, and, to his, and he would be surprised probably to find that I don't reject it completely. Uh, um, so I don't think investment savings is, is an identity any more than demand and supply is, is an identity. It's the byproduct of behavioral behavior, and I was describing the behavior. What is interesting is not that investment savings are equal. What is interesting is the prices at which it's equal. And the prices are ones I've described, namely unbelievably low, as shown by real interest rates. It's, there's no doubt whatsoever in the process of generating demand, which is what central banks were doing, in the boom period before the crisis, notably in the US under Greenspan, uh, but also, I'm afraid to say, in Spain under the ECB uh, and in UK under the Bank of England, uh, um, there was a hell of a lot of malinvestment. In just the same way, I think what the Chinese have just done, though it's generated a lot of growth, is probably going to turn out the biggest malinvestment process in the history of the world. But we'll see. We'll see. It's certainly been a sensational investment boom, um, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if about a fifth of the capital stock had to be wiped out. Will developing countries save us? In theory, they could. Um, but that will lead us to another set of questions, which I think is very deep and very important. 
which is how do you get net flows to developing countries of the relevant scale without developing colossal currency mismatches in their financial system, which generate giant crises. This is what every intelligent um, uh, developing country policymaker will ask. And there are two answers to that. One, we go back to the gold standard, which I don't think is a relevant, I mean, I, a single world money. And there is a reason why the single world money of the late 90s and early 20th centuries worked better than, in my view, than our system. But we don't have, I don't think that's relevant. The second thing actually links beautifully, and it's my very last comment, with Jean-Claude. Because I agree overwhelmingly, and I've written this on several occasions, uh, we have created a financial system as a whole, which in our countries and globally is far too debt reliant and far too little equity reliant. This is a very big problem in the Eurozone, which is not adequately discussed. The German surpluses would be a trivial problem if they were all equity balanced. Uh, our tax system discourages equity. Accounting rules and bankruptcy codes across the world, developing countries particularly, are a total mess which discourages equity. Um, so it's mostly FDI, except to a very limited economies. But I do agree that if I were doing the work program for the IMF and the global system, getting a structure of capital flows from the rich, aged countries, the developing countries, which is less crisis prone and therefore more equity based, is probably the single most important thing you can do. And as far as I can see, nobody's talking about it, which is surprising. Thank you very much on that. Uh, I think this is at least, uh, uh, could be at least the way forward. But Ed, you, you have still some questions to answer. Yeah, well, I, in, the, in the couple of minutes we, we have left, on the, on the resolution question, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with, with Martin, it, it will get done um, in the, if the circumstances require it. We can see still today um, the tendency, as I touched on in my uh, opening remarks, um, for taxpayers still to be involved where they can be, for people, for, for jurisdictions to try and wriggle away from BRRD. I think if there was a systemic problem, um, it would be whatever is needed to be done. Um, uh, unfortunately, what we can do is try to make sure that on an individual firm basis, we're moving away from that, uh, that, that scenario and protecting the, the taxpayer. Um, on consolidation, it's a, it's a very difficult question to, to, to answer. Uh, if I can come at it a slightly uh, aside, um, that the barriers for firms within the Eurozone to operate on a cross-border basis, I'm not talking about takeover, but just from Germany into Ireland, that actually, and Ireland is very different. Ireland is actually uh, pr arguably underbanked, too concentrated, um, are very, very low. Um, so the, the barriers to, to, to encourage cross-border uh, competition provision services are very low. Um, the desire for firms to make investment um, to, to take over uh, operations, clearly the equity, uh, the, the ROE uh, isn't attractive enough. You can talk about NPLs, you can talk about other issues, um, but I'd say it's multifaceted. But what I would say is the regulatory barriers to, to, to it are, are, are pretty low. I'm sure Martin's right in terms of um, some of the, the, the underlying reasons. Um, and then the final, there's touch on de demographic change. I think this is one of the big issues that we don't talk about enough. Um, this and uh, uh, the, the, ch the, the changing, the aging demographic of the European population is a, not just for, for banks, it's a, it's a, it's a very significant problem uh, for, for the EU. We can see it uh, writ large in, in some jurisdictions already. It's a problem in Japan, clearly. Uh, we can see it in, in the likes of Finland. Um, it's coming, to, coming in Italy. Um, uh, and I think we need to be bracing ourselves for that and thinking very actively about it. And finally, it was kind of one of the, the early, earlier questions. I think an, another issue we need to be very actively thinking about is climate change, which has a, an exponential shape in terms of uh, uh, risk. And that will require, to go back to my early, again to my early point, a kind of a, a very um, joined up, um, and forward-looking uh, uh, approach to dealing with it. Well, both gentlemen, thank you very much. I think we can give them a good applause. <laughs>